And while they do that, um, I'll show you this slide. Uh, the AAPS, uh, in conjunction with the FDA, um, NCL, uh, and the NBCD Working Party, organized this workshop in Washington, in Baltimore, the 28th and the 29th of this year. Um, you see a number of the uh, usual suspects uh, being involved in the uh, programming. And uh, so we invite you uh, to uh, make a note in your calendar and uh, be there. Um, well, we had, an, uh, we had an, uh, six 15 minutes uh, set of presentations, three more overviewing the situation, two on the regulatory side, and three case studies. And uh, I would like to um, open up the, uh, the floor for uh, question and answer because we had to be very, very tight in keeping control of the timing. So, yes, please, identify yourself and then Alberto. Hi, yeah. I'm Joy Wolfram from uh, Houston Methodist Research Institute in the US. And I had a specific question about the abraxane um, distribution within the tumor. What is the reason, do you think, for um, that it's more spread out in comparison to, let's say, DMSO injection? Uh, I, I, to be honest, uh, I would say we don't know. Uh, we can postulate, based on some studies that we've done, is that the albumin, in fact, helps the transport, uh, whether it's through the tumor cells or the interstitial cells that are within the tumor, to help transport it through. So, uh, so it's hard to answer that question um, fully because it's a, you know, it's a highly complex milieu that you're injecting the drug into, and you can't sort of nail down one particular parameter. But uh, you know, we've seen transcytosis in endothelial cells and in epithelial cells. So to the extent that those are in the tumor, it may be helping it. Uh, some tumor cells, in fact, take up albumin as part of their uh, nutrition source. So that could be another factor. And there's probably other factors that we don't know about yet. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm Alberto Gabizon from Hebrew University, Jerusalem. Uh, just first, a, a quick remark. I think it would be good to have not only innovators in such a type of session, but also representative of a generic company so that we could, and, and this is addressed to you, Dan. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I can't agree more with you than, than what you're saying now. Uh, Alberto, believe me, we really tried. We really tried very hard to involve uh, generic companies but we failed miserably. Don't blame us. Okay. Uh, but go. you're totally, oh. and to be frank, here in Baltimore, I mean, I'm really going to go for it now. Yeah. We have generic companies, and I would like to thank uh, Willin um, for that. We have generic companies. So finally, they open up, but we, here in this case, you see, I'm rather emotional about this. <laughs> we failed miserably. We couldn't find them. So point taken, hit, okay. touche. But uh, it's enough I... with two languages. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and now I go to my question, which has to do with the fact that at least in two of the of the examples, um, uh, the presentations have dealt with things that. Uh, we don't understand the product. In, in fact, we have been told that the intricacies of the product cannot be well characterized, and, and therefore, this is, of course, making extremely difficult for any generic manufacturer to, uh, uh, to make a, a compound. So I'm wondering whether the regulatory um, people that are here would say, well, in those cases, you don't understand your own product, even though you are the innovator. So so we have to judge by performance in a clinical study. Is that the way to go? Well, Raymond and uh, Frank, who's going to take the, <laughs> the challenge? Yeah, actually, uh, here I don't think I fully with, agree with uh, some of the speakers' uh, point of view. I think with uh, um, advancement of the analytic technology, actually nowadays, 
we have a better idea about uh, some of these products than 20 years ago. For example, when Doxel was first developed and uh, not many uh, advanced analytical techn techniques are available. And uh, uh, for example, for this uh, Abraxan case, actually I do have a question for Dr. Desai. Um, you raised the question about the immunogenicity concern uh, of this drug product. And uh, here I want to ask you, if you change the manufacturer of the albumin, what are you going to do? I think on your first slide, you mentioned that albumin is not an inactive ingredient. It's an in, uh, integral part of the active ingredient. So if you are going to change the manufacturer of uh, human serum albumin, what type of study do you propose to do? Because I think that standard should be applicable to the generic too. Yeah, the, that's an interesting question, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's um, to give you a roundabout answer, to, <laughs> to the, there's the sourcing of albumin is very important, right? So, so depending on which company, you know, there's a few different companies that make human albumin, and uh, depending on who you pick, uh, they can source albumin from a Caucasian population, or they may source it from a different population. And that could, in fact, have an impact on the outcome. So, for example, if you give Caucasian albumin to an Asian population, what's the impact of that, uh, or vice versa? And uh, you know, we've seen uh, some in some clinical studies where we, in fact, where we were sourcing Caucasian albumin, and then we did a trial in China, for example, uh, where you see the incidence of rash is higher than you see in the Western population. So, so those are complex issues, and uh, you know I can't fully answer your question, but we try to keep the sourcing and of the albumin, uh, you know, the same if we have to have a backup manufacturer or alternate manufacturer. So, and there, there's tests you can do, limited tests you can do on the albumin sourcing, uh, which are in fact tests that are required for injectable albumin product itself, because the product that we use is not just raw albumin, it's an injectable grade human albumin which is subject to all of the FDA criteria or EU criteria. I'm terribly sorry, but I think we, uh, Falk, you wanna add something to this because there are three gentlemen that I would like to give the floor, it's almost the fourth, uh, 3.30. That gentleman, that gentleman, and that gentleman. And then, sorry, we have to close. And so if you want to talk with the speakers, then do that later. Please identify yourself, identify yourself later, and then you can have the last word. Yes, my name is Omid Farrakhsad um, from Boston. And the question is for, uh, for Neil, um, uh, specifically about Abraxane. Neil, uh, I learned a lot today. I hadn't heard you speak in a few years. Um, <clears throat> In the old slides, maybe even the one that was uh, shown to the FDA during the, uh, the whole approval process of the drug, there was one particular slide that was very intriguing to me back then, and that was that um, the drug exists as a 130 nanometer particle in a vial, and there is a very rapid um, dissolution that happens in a concentration-dependent way that it breaks down to about a 13 to 15 nanometer structure. And that happens almost inland. In other words, if you look at that curve, it's a very rapid reduction in size. Do you remember that curve, by the way? Uh, yeah, sure. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> Good memory. <laughs> yeah. So the, so the question is, um, um, that's a bit different than the picture now, which is that there is this very, com by the way, complexity is much more likely to be a real thing in drug development than a simple story. Um, so hearing that it's now a complex story of a monomeric, dimeric, polymeric albumin is interesting to me. Uh, but how do you reconcile that with the, <laughs> how do you reconcile that with the initial observations that they were breaking down to the small particles? And also, have you looked at the same uh, small particle with these other um, 
generic versions of a Braxton that are coming to see if they're observing the same thing or not. Okay, so that's a complex question, uh, and, I, and I think, um, so, so the initial curve you refer to is, is still valid. So that's in an in vitro situation, uh, in a, so it's not necessarily in vivo. But the, what's happening is once you reach a threshold of concentration, uh, your particles start breaking down. Uh, and if you're below the threshold, they'll break down quickly. If you're above the threshold, they will slowly dissolve until you get to the threshold. So, so uh, I mean, I probably need five minutes to explain exactly what, what happens. So, so the story is no different. What you're referring to, the data from earlier, is in a specific in vitro test that where it was designed to you look at your this side of the threshold or that side, and then you get a rapid breakdown. So those monomeric, dimeric, oligomeric species were all there. Uh, it's just that we weren't looking at that aspect. Uh, this is looking at something in more detail. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> one, one quick comment and then a question for Iris. Um, there was a statement made, and I won't point out the person, but I think it's naive to think that we can go ahead and analyze every aspect of what's happening in this field right now to be able to find out exactly what's happening because there's far too many diseases we don't have cures for, and there is no alternative. So I'm, I say this because I don't want people to walk away thinking if you have something that may work and show efficacy in an animal model, you don't have to know all of the parameters in order to get it approved to be used to help humanity. I'll say that, and you can comment on that in a second. But Iris, um, going back to your presentation, it was, it was quite interesting. Have you looked at the contribution of microglia and the interaction when you start the chemokine and cytokine cascade with some of the, um, the products, or some of the, the, I'll call them the short pieces of copaxin? Copaxo. Iris, you start with the <coughs> question and then we go back to the first question because uh, we need to open it there as well. So please sure. So quickly, we, we did not look at cytokine secretion in these data that I presented today because it's very unspecific, it's very variable. What we did look at the gene expression profiling in the different systems. So that's a, a different measurement. Now we go to the, your first question. Uh, can you may, maybe repeat it? Because I think the, in particular the regulator should sort of also be involved. And yes, please, your, your first question now. Um, I think it's naive. It's more of a comment than a question. I think it's naive to assume that we can analyze everything and know all of the parameters of everything that's being used to treat diseases we have no cure for at the time. And Abraxane is one of those, Capaxone is another, where we have two diseases that we had no cure for at the time. And these things came along and showed efficacy in animal models and could move into humans. And I guess the question would be is, do you agree or disagree with that? I would like to hear both FDA and EMA and in what, what kind of sequence, because it is a very basic question. Um, it's, it's maybe a naive question, but it's, it's it, yeah, why should we spend time on this? Why are you sitting here? So maybe uh, FDA, EMA, uh, fall. Why don't you take the initiative here? Well, it brings a bit together what um, I think coming to the first question, why is no, um generic company sitting here and I'm just wondering, um, looking at your both presentation from, 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 from the innovator, um, whether you would emphasize the same issues if you look for first in man or for regulatory approval and I highly doubt it to be honest. So um, I think um, it's important to see from, from, from all sides without taking any, any, any position here and um, I fully agree, you cannot look at all the parameters, you have to look at critical parameters and um, can you look in the crystal ball? No, nobody has a crystal ball. And we have two examples here where it's extremely difficult to look at the crystal ball. Now, same thing I would say to take both sides now, um, to copy these very complex uh, products, maybe you don't need to look at all the parameters as well. And maybe some parameters which have been identified here, 
gene signature. I don't know whether you look at all the genes, there's certain genes do you compare within yourself, maybe your product half a year ago with different gene signatures. Now we know that in the morning and the evening it can be different. So I would have lots of questions on these things and um, maybe kind of, I, I don't have the answer for this one, but um, of course you can make things more complex than they, than they are in terms of um, other intention, but um, it depends on what, what's your goal. But we have very, two very good products which are very good for healthcare systems in the, in the world and um, whether you can copy them or not or how you copy them, I think this is um, a balance in terms of um, risk you want to take and um, acceptable things. And you cannot look at everything, I fully agree. Wait, well. Yeah, when we know these uh, complex drug products it has like batch to batch variability even for the reference drug. So actually um, uh, from FDA what we uh, recommend is to ask the generic applicants to secure as many lots of the reference product as possible to characterize them. Then they can have a good understanding about the variability among the batches within the reference product. Then we can use that kind of as a scale to uh, have the generic products fall in that variability range. Uh, I think we, we should stop here with this question. Go to the last question, because I get all kinds of signals that uh, my time management is uh, failing. Yes, please, last question. Frank, do you want to do it instead? Well, I have a comment to the comment. Of course, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a problem uh, from a legal point of view because the Waxman regs for the U.S. define that there is the opportunity to submit generics under the circumstance that you can characterize the product to the extent that you have comfort and take comfort in the quality of it, right? And if you fail in the characterization, then we should think very hard and carefully if this is some risk that a regulatory agency is supposed to take and put something on the market, and if we should not have uh, legal support to request clinical efficacy studies. I think this is a very studies. nice end of the story. Um, you have to be careful, and there's a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the regulators. So let's be very uh, careful with, with them. Um, having said that, um, yes, we have to stop here. It's unfortunate that we can't go on because there were quite a few other questionnaires in the, in the room. Uh, thanks for coming. Thank the uh, speakers for um, their presentations. Um, and uh, those of you who asked questions. And um, don't forget to book. <laughs>